My name is Ned. I'm a bud tender up at Taya and Tanegra, uh, native flower. Spring has sprung, so come and clone with us. Uh, I'm here to introduce Confessions of a Rock and Roll Cameraman, episode eight. Take one. Welcome to another exciting episode of Confessions of a Rock and Roll Cameraman, the NASA Space Astronauts Edition. I'm your host, Pat Canavan, in conversation with excellent rock and roll cameraman, Tony Wanamaker. Thank you, Pat. Appreciate Thank that. Thanks for being here, Tony. Today, <laughs> we're going to talk about space. Love it. Space, NASA, astronauts. Here we are. Tony, when I was a kid, they were sending people to the moon. They were landing on the moon. Now, Tell me about your experience of landing on the moon. Because well, like millions of other people, I happened to, to witness the landing on the moon. We saw it in a black and white TV. It was kind of broken up, but there it was, man. Incredible technological achievement. In the 20th century, we made it to another celestial body. Incredible, man. And so I was a kid. I was sick. I was on a uh, southern Ontario vacation with the folks driving around the car and camping. Good fun. And my parents thought it was absolutely imperative that we see this piece of history. So they checked us into a little flea bag hotel, rabbit ears on the TV, brother, black and white. I had the flu, I'm sick as a dog. And my mother playing Florence Nightingale, as all good mothers do, managed to resuscitate me enough to lift my little head to see uh, Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. That was amazing. Hearing that, seeing that, and I passed out because I was a sick boy, and my mom managed to wake me up later. So around 10 o'clock p.m., those six hours had transpired since they landed, and he said, uh, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Amazing. Now, the second guy out, Buzz Aldrin, he came out, and he also said a great thing. He said, he looked around and said, magnificent desolation. Very cool things. Huh. Yeah. Wow. I would have thought he said... I brought food. <laughs> I brought keys to the Land Rover. Because that's the funny thing, right? Yeah. You go to the moon and then yeah. they, they, they're guys. They brought a car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they didn't on that. No. No, because they didn't know they could drive up there yet. But um, but the it, space race, I mean, it, it you was think a about race. it. Well, it was total space race. And as kids in that era, uh, I grew up. So assemblies in my public school, we would have this towering black and white TV that would come out. And much fanfare when that came out in the hallways. And uh, we would all assemble to watch the Mercury programs, the Gemini programs, and Apollo. And what was amazing, think about this, I'm conditioned as a kid thinking these magnificent technological achievements happen every week. Not a big deal going to space. Uh, and we see that in the Apollo program where everybody watched 11th. Few people started watching 12. People regalvanized to start watching 13. Hey, here, here we've had a problem here because we almost lost it, and Jim Lovell saved us. And then most people, the primacy recency effect, Pat, they remember the first astronauts, and remember the last astronauts, right? But, uh, and we're going to talk in a minute about uh, Apollo 12, the uh, yeah. second, the third and fourth astronaut. And I think people got, it's, it's not that they got bored, uh, but, you know, we get so, we got so conditioned to television. Yes. That we got conditioned to, to watching Star Trek battling aliens every week, <laughs> and then, Oddly enough, when we landed on the moon, that was sort of the year that they ended Star Trek. Yeah, yeah interesting. Um, when we go to look at, at what goes on, on the moon, we're actually seeing the work of what it takes to build things and not yeah. like the, the whole yeah. story and, yes. and, and whatnot. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. But that wasn't the only time you were there seeing uh, a, a space program. I mean, 25 years later? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, uh, well, here we are. We landed on the moon in 69. 25 yeah. years later, it's 1994. And I happen to be at Fort Wilderness, which is a, uh, an encampment at Disney World. A lot of fun. I and just have to say, this is a true <laughs> space fan, right? He goes to Disney with his family yeah. and then yeah. takes off. <laughs> so Papa Bear is up in the morning for uh, morning pee and a coffee. And the radio's on. And what do I hear? Lo and behold, there's going to be a launch, man. STS, space shuttle, right? 65, Columbia. And uh, so lo and behold, I get out and I, kids, wrap it up. We're going to Kennedy Space Center. Everybody wrap it up. Let's go. And they're like, what? Pandemonium. And I'm flying down the I-95 by. So, oh, I'm, I'm giving her, eh? Yeah. So I get there in Cocoa Beach, man, which is the cool place if you hang out if you're an astronaut, right? 
right? So we find a spot in Cocoa Beach with everybody else. It was fantastic. We were on a causeway. And so we lined up our car on the causeway with hundreds of other people. Radio's all blaring, <laughs> right? To hear the yeah. countdown. Uh, my girls were four at the time, my twins. And so I had them down playing in the, there's a little uh, beach area they could play. But Ron and I had to be vigilant, Pat, because of the alligators, right? Oh, my God. There's Lots of them there. So you got to be careful. And uh, Well, now I know why they actually <laughs> set off the uh, the spacecraft from there. Because the, no one's going to battle <laughs> alligators unless you're James Bond <laughs> right? to, to get to the to Scary, the keep them away, man. Keep them away. Wow. And uh, lo and behold, man, we saw the uh, Columbia lift. And to see the magnitude of order is such a, a, a miracle. Uh, it's an incredible thing to bear witness. And anybody who has it, if you can, uh, do yourself a favor. Pay attention to when NASA is launching and go down and see something. You know, Elon Musk is launching the dragons, the dragon with the Falcon uh, rocket all the time now. Uh, we know that uh, Blue Origin is making uh, motions there and, and Virgin as well. But NASA, 39A. 39A launch pad, the most famous launch pad in the world. That's where we, we ended up landing on the moon because of that. Wow. That's absolutely an astonishing uh, coincidence. Yeah. That yeah. You're, you're down in Florida yes. and a couple hours down the road is the <laughs> launch. Time to go. Yeah. Make it happen. That's, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. But with that being the 25th anniversary of Apollo. Yes. Uh, Columbia going up. There's a bit of a sad story, uh, as you know, with Columbia, because uh, in 2003, we had a freakish accident where uh, on liftoff, we lost a bit of the thermal protection panel on the underside of one of the wings. I believe it was the left wing. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. And so on reentry, it, it overheated and uh, sadly, it uh, ended up uh, killing all seven of the astronauts. Devastating. And and that's the thing with space, right? I mean... <clears throat> it's super dangerous. It's super dangerous, yeah. Yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's... When you experience it physically, it's kind of different than when you're watching it on TV because on TV... Well... We, we see all sort of, of dramatic reenactments and stories, but the real life thing yeah. is... Yeah. Our podcast viewers are going to enjoy this because Pat's going to run a section of that STS-65 launch. And you'll see... Now, pay attention inside the capsule... Uh, with, the, with the astronauts and take a look at the amount of shaking. They say it's like this this truck that's gone awry and bolts and pins and wires and everything's flying off it, but somehow it managed to, to hold and, and, and break through and find itself in space. So yeah, pay attention to launches, good fun. Yeah, I, uh, I've never had that experience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, by the time most people, I guess, get to go into space, we won't have that feeling anymore. It'll be more because of what these people do and because of our technology and, and the work that, that uh, our multi-billionaires are doing to escape our planet. We're going to see the benefits of that in the next few years. But um, the Apollo 11 was the first and then apollo 13 was the most dramatic yes you know i don't know how they got uh, tom hanks up there but uh, man they did it <laughs> right and then apollo 17 yeah yeah let's talk about let's talk about that well you know you know i'm gonna uh, i'm gonna talk about alan bean in a second and alan bean was the fourth person to walk on another celestial body and that's profound because only 12 humans have ever walked on another another world so, and only four of them uh, li are living today. These are the, uh, the folks from The Right Stuff and the jet fighter pilot. As a matter of fact, uh, it's an interesting thing that Alan Bean uh, was the only, one of the few astronauts, I believe the only of the Apollo program that actually never flew before. Uh, when you fly into space, you get your astronaut wings. And he was presented as astronaut wings on Apollo 12, which is fan fascinating because everybody prior either was on the Mercury mission or Gemini. So to be the first one in there, he got in there because of the commander of that, uh, of that crew. Pete Conrad was a good friend of his from the Navy uh, fighter squadron and said, no, we got to have Pete because uh, got to have Alan, I stand corrected, because a friend of his who was going to be the lunar module pilot, which Alan Bean took over, uh, uh, unfortunately, he was killed in a, in a jet uh, crash. So oh. that ended that. So Bean subbed in. That's exactly it. And that reminded me, and I'll quick, quick digress here, of like U.S. President Gerald Ford, who wasn't 
elected as a vice president and then became the president, which he wasn't elected. So he managed to get all this past and become the most powerful human in the free world. But well, here's Alan Bean, one of the most coveted spots in the world uh, to get a ride on an Apollo mission, and he's never flown before. Wow. It's amazing. You have these run-ins all the time, like uh, serendipity seems to <laughs> follow you. Yes. Um, Very lucky. So, so now you're in, in Los Angeles. Yes. And you are, what do you, you, are you down there with much music? Who are you working with in Los Angeles? Well, I'm, I'm with Ed the Sock. I'm directing Ed the Sock at this time, and I'm terrorizing, right, Southern California. Okay. So what is it? With, a smoking pop. What is it with you, the Sock, <laughs> and space? Because you, you were accosting Chatner with the Sock, and now you're in, now you're in LA. Are you going to accost Alan Bean with the Sock? How, how no, did you work that, out? that was a complete fluke, man. I was reading the local rag at the day, and uh, in that newspaper article, I found a, an advertisement citing that Alan Bean was about to uh, to conduct a seminar at a local art gallery, and uh, I thought, hey, we got to attend this, man. So as a fan, as a fan to get a, meet, a chance to meet a moonwalker again, right? like so. So yeah. you, not only are you shooting, yeah, uh, stars, yeah, you're a fan of these I'm a stars, huge fan, and that's what makes it so much fun, man. And you know, I'm you, right? Except I had the two ton pencil. <laughs> so how did you meet Alan Bean? So, uh, so I managed to persuade Ed the Sox, Steve Kersner, and Leanna to to head over with me to let's talk to let's do something with him, right? Uh, and it was wonderful because, as I said, he's a painter and he's one of the few artists, if you will, who have ever been on another world, an outer world, and, and painted it. And what was cool is Alan Bean, uh, uh, first of all, on that launch, they were hit twice by lightning. Unbelievable. And within seconds, it was one, <laughs> one engineer who actually remembered in rehearsals and training what this sequence of button does. So wait, they're... They had to be leaving the Earth to get yep. hit by lightning. You yeah. Don't, yeah. You're not out yeah. of the atmosphere to yeah. get hit by lightning. So on their way up, very soon, yes. They got hit. Yeah, twice, almost 30 seconds apart. And the second one knocked out all their power. And they said they'd never seen that many lights light up. And within seconds, if this young engineer didn't call in and said, "Hey, I think it was set," uh, and I think the number was SEC, whatever that stands for, Try another NASA SCE acronym, to auxiliary, to, uh, auxiliary uh, that'll uh, save the day, and it did. And they can continue the mission. Otherwise, they would have had to abort within seconds. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And so Bean was the guy in charge of that. Bean was on top of that and liaising with that young engineer. Yeah. And they figured it out and they cracked it and away they went. So now Bean returns to the Earth and he keeps with them a little souvenir. He's got a handle. Imagine what that cost NASA, right? So he's got the hammer that he was banging in the American flag with. And I think he broke it. So that's why it hangs kind of limp on that one. <laughs> Funny, right? He also had a faux pas where he, 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 he took the Vidicon cameras, which was a tube camera, and, and, and unfortunately had them lined at the sun when he turned them on, so they burnt them out and they couldn't use them. Oh, right? no. <laughs> yeah. But he did return to Earth with that hammer and another uh, uh, piece of equipment that uh, he used to pound down some instruments. And on his paintings, which is really cool, he scores, he's got a, a moon boot. Uh, an impression from his own and he made it into bronze and he stamps the paintings okay pretty cool and then he marks it with the uh, lunar hammer and then this other thing he puts these circles on it as well but lastly most importantly he was allowed to keep some of his badges i have some of these badges i'll explain in a minute and on these badges he cut them up managed to crush them up mortar and pestle kind of thing i guess and uh, anyways he puts them in his paintings because people will have actual moon dust in their paintings wait Right. He took the badges off because yes. they had moon dust in them. Yes. Yeah. Can you imagine? Oh, my God. So here's, here's some from a, a, another mission. These are genuine articles. This is from uh, when Hadfield, Chris Hadfield in 2001 did a spacewalk uh, for the Canadian Space Agency. And uh, so we would have been a patch like, th like this, right? And he would have cut, he cut, you see them now, he has them cut in half because he saved part of it. And it, they mean so much to them, of course, and then managed to crunch that down and, and, and all that material. So you get a bit of his actual garment he wore walking the, the uh, moon surface and additionally some moon dust. Pretty cool painting. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, it is. When you met him. Yeah. Uh, why were you there to see him? Uh, really? None other than my own fancy. Yeah. I just thought I have a chance to meet a moonwalker. So you got to meet Alan Bean. You got to see his artwork and his commentary and, and the passion of the man. 
Did you talk to him about his experience up there in space? Well, what was really unique is that there was a young man with me, just before me, young, probably about 14 years old. Okay. And he had a globe of the moon, which is fascinating. I thought how, how adroit that was, that move. So he presented that to Alan, and Alan got really excited because he immediately pointed to the ocean of storms where they landed. Oh, wow, See? that's cool. Yeah, and he pointed that out to the young man, and right then, the question was posited. Did you experience anything? On, and Alan picked up on that in a heartbeat, and he said, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. When I traveled to the dark side of the moon the first time, I experienced the force of God. And I thought that was such a profound statement. I didn't even have a rejoinder at the time. I just was gobsmacked. Yeah, And I thought, wow, what an interesting thought. I'm agnostic, so it has a profound effect. Um, but I'm also an agnostic who's touched the birthplace of Christ. So there's been interesting interactions in my own thought process. But yeah, a profound statement and a wonderful thing to hear from, from an astronaut. Wow. Yeah. Well, <laughs> never being to space and with only 12 guys uh, f you know, from North America being on the moon. Yeah, it's it's... It's a very VIP club uh, yeah. right now. And yeah. and having experiences like that really say a lot about the person, especially somebody who who's really that creative as well. Yes. You yeah. know, he's not he wasn't just a pilot, he wasn't just he, but he's a he's a guy who's in touch with his creative self. Yeah, and speaking of creativity, uh, because they had issues with cameras, they wanted to uh, to take the first selfie of, of and you've seen uh, pictures in Apollo 11, and it's all singular, right? Yeah. Uh, because one's shooting the other one. And so here, Alan Bean wanted to line up beside Pete Conrad and do a shot, but that was another piece of equipment they broke. So it's like, well, I'm going to have to settle for the still. So Alan Bean turned around in his book and actually painted what it would have looked like. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Canada had a great impact yes. on space. We've we've really offered a lot to the space program. We've done mm -hmm. a lot and we've had great players in that field. But you got to meet some great Canadian astronauts. How yes. is it that you got to meet uh, Julie Payette? Well, 2001, I'm down at the Houston Space Center. Amazing, right? This is this is where they talk to the astronauts, right? And uh, the commander uh, of the uh, the chief astronaut, if you will, of the Canadian Space Agency was Julie Payette at the time. And uh, so I was liaising with her, and uh, I, I asked her, and she was gracious, and we did the uh, an interview with Julie. But uh, I was chatting with uh, the, the number one uh, astronaut in Canada, Mark Garneau, who was I was liaising with him in Ottawa. But at the same time, this new awesome astronaut named Chris Hadfield was about to make the first Canadian spacewalk, man. The first Canadian yeah. spacewalk. Yeah. yeah. How do you how do you make a spacewalk? Like I know you're a scuba diver, you need yeah. specific gear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, space. It's the opposite of that. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, what's amazing is that uh, in the land of acronyms, which is NASA, National, uh, National Aeronautical Space Administration, and so to do a EVA, which is an extra vecular activity, and they marked it, that's AKA spacewalk. Uh, so that's what Chris did, and he did a 14-hour spacewalk, man, the first time out. And that's significant because the first Space Walker was a Soviet astronaut, a cosmonaut, I stand corrected, who did it for like uh, two minutes and six seconds or something. <laughs> 14 hours. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my yeah. God, the average work day is eight hours. Incredible, incredible. In space. So I was that close to conducting an interview with him. Actually, I would have been at Houston talking with him directly, right? Uh, while he's maneuvering the spacewalk, which would have been incredible, but it was canceled because uh, as it happens, uh, some malfunction went down and NASA immediately left that problem and went to fix this problem. Right? Well, yeah, I yeah. mean, when you're, when you're yeah. dealing with people's lives yes. in space, uh, <clears throat> yeah. it's immediate and anything terrestrial is, is not important. Put down that Twinkie, people. There's something going on in space. So, Chris Hatfield, though. Yeah. I mean, what an icon. A huge icon, and we know that because years later, when he was commanding the International Space Station, he felt inspired. And so what he did was, uh, he was a big fan of David Bowie, and David Bowie had a huge song called Space Oddity. I think he wrote it in 69. But nevertheless, 
Chris Atfield is a bit of a guitar player, quite a good vocalist, and he ended up playing his version of it. And what is it, in uh, January of 2020, I think it's been re recorded that 45 million people have watched this video. That's incredible. Yeah. That's Even incredible. David Bowie commented on it, said it was the most endearing videos he's ever seen of his song. Chris Hadfield had a great impact because he took his personality back to the people uh, with the David Bowie song. Let's talk more about Canada's space contribution, yes. the Canada arm. Yeah, huge, huge. It's, it's how we work the International Space Station. It's how we can fix it. It's how we put new modules on it. I mean, it's instrumental. It's fantastic. And Pat, I actually got to see the first one in Milton in 1982. I was a junior cameraman at City Pulse. Yeah. You got to see the first Canon Arm. Yeah, yeah. Before it had the big muscles. <laughs> <laughs> yes, before it was pumping up. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it was represented by uh, two uh, American astronauts. Uh, uh, Richard uh, Truly and Joe Engel, who were there to uh, to do this dog and pony show uh, and to show off the Canada arm. Uh, and what was great, it, it really fascinating for me was uh, later I discovered that Joe Engel uh, had the ignoble uh, position that he was released from Apollo 17, unfortunately. Yeah. So who? Yeah. He Engel was replaced. That's correct. Before and going up. Yeah, because he was the last breed, if you will, of the jet, sort of the right stuff, the jet fighter pilot. Things had changed. NASA realized quickly they weren't going to go into Apollo 35. It wasn't happening. They were right. cutting missions down. And as a result, there was a new value. And the new value was it was really important to have a PhD, a geologist on board, right? And so now, really, Harrison Schmidt was the guy who replaced Joe Engel. And he really it was the demarcation, the point where now we have astronauts who have multiple doctorates, right? You, you know, it's assumed you can fly a jet fighter. <laughs> right. Yeah. Absolutely astonishing, though. I mean, your experiences with space, yeah. with, uh, you know, witnessing the first Apollo landing, talking to Mr. Bean about the last Apollo landing, uh, working with space, the imagination station, yeah, yeah. you know, and just all of the events that, that come to you. It's amazing. I can't wait to read more Thank about you, this in the book. Yes. Because yeah. the, your space uh, essay is quite long and it has a lot of information. There's a, there's a lot of those crossroads and connections. And as yeah. you said, and thank you, Pat, it's kind of a full circle from the, from the moment I was a kid and, and witnessed uh, Neil Armstrong on the surface of the moon to, uh, to uh, finishing it with the notion of understanding, meeting Joe Engel, who ostensibly could have been the last person to walk on the moon. But it was a good old Harrison Smith. Well, thanks for tuning in to this astronaut version, space version of Confessions of a Rock and Roll Cameraman. Tony's adventures that I'm living here with you are exciting and riveting. Uh, I've learned more about space, specific astronauts, things that I've never known before. So thanks for tuning in. Tony, thanks Thank for you, sharing Pat. with with the Corn RC community yes. your experiences. Gotta love NASA. And by the way, Pat, last beat, 2022. We're going back to the moon this year, man, on the Artemis Project. So... This is great. So while our friends in the commercial business, Blue Origin, Virgin, Elon Musk, they handle what they call the low Earth orbit economy, that allows NASA, brother, to go to the moon and on to Mars. So 20, uh, 2022, folks, you're going to hear again. We're going to circumnavigate the moon again. Awesome. Looking forward to it. And it's going to be multi-gendered, right? And both men and women. Fantastic. That was like a show I know. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.